Okay, it's a pop-up edition of Condo Insider here on a given Monday morning. And I'm Jay Fidel, and I'm here with Jane Sugimura, who is the true host of Condo Insider. We'll call her today special host guest. Hi, Jane. Hi, Jay. <laughs> what we want to talk about today is something that is not necessarily discussed on uh, Condo Insider, and it's, uh, it's the history of condos in Hawaii and the history of leaseholds. Uh, which is kind of, you know, integrated, wedded. The history of those two things, uh, you know, they're, they're integrated together. They're, they're part of the same ball of wax. And so in the first part of our show, we'll talk about, um, you know, the history of the model of condos. The second part of our show, we'll, we'll talk about uh, leasehold, uh, which is, um, you know, not popular anymore, but it's still around and, and it's very important. Com and coming back. And coming back. Oh, okay. All right, let's talk about the history of, of, uh, of condos. Condos was an idea. Hawaii was one of the first places that did condos. And the year, as I remember, for the, the horizontal property regime statute, now, uh, you know, all codified in Chapter, what, 514A? 514A was repealed effective the beginning of this year. Oh, my goodness. Yes. You're going to have to straighten me so out. So now, 19... now it's 514B is that same effect. <laughs> Change is good. Right. So 1960 was the year. It was just looking back, it was one year after statehood. One year after statehood. And uh, the state of Hawaii um, came up with this idea. It has had a profound effect, a hugely profound effect on real estate in Hawaii and housing in Hawaii, don't you think? It has because it's offered, uh, you know, people uh, you know, uh, an alternative to housing. And in Hawaii, where land is very scarce and very valuable and expensive, you know, that seems like the economic and efficient way to go is to go upward. It, was, it seemed then, anyway, a really good, fresh idea. Um, and we were, Hawaii was one of the first states uh, to adopt such a statute with a horizontal property regime, which was both horizontal and not vertical and all that. Um, and it changed the real estate industry for sure. It changed brokering, it changed the marketplace, valuations, it changed the opportunities for a buyer, and for that matter, a seller, because it was much easier to buy, much easier to sell um, a condo unit, no? Yes, it was. And so it was at the same time imperfect, wasn't it? Because we, did, we didn't have that much experience with it. And in those days, as I remember, um, the people who lived in condos were the owners of the condos. Yes. Buildings were owner-occupied. In fact, you got a better price if you were an owner-occupant. I don't know if that's so today. Um, and, you know, uh, my wife and I lived in condos uh, for a few years. And, uh, gee whiz, uh, it was like being in a community, in a family, because they all knew each other, and they were all owner-occupants. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But somewhere along the line, that changed, didn't it? It did. And I think it had something to do with the visitor industry, because I think the first, uh, uh, we, and I was not here, but I was told that there were Canadians who came. They were called snowbirds, and they bought units in Waikiki that became you know, very, very popular. And, um, and so, so you had you know, these outsiders who would come and you know, basically buy these units, and then the next wave would probably have been the Japanese in the 80s. Yeah. And now you mentioned Waikiki, because I think Waikiki was um, one of the first places where condominiums were, were built and developed and, and where they thrived. And, you know, before that time, Waikiki, a good part of Waikiki was called the jungle. Um, it was back, you know, back toward the zoo end of things. And uh, it was a rundown area. It was even dangerous. Uh, shacks. There's still some left, by the way. But that's where, you know, development was. And, and it was for visitors who wanted a piece of the rock. Right. They could, they, could have, they could spend some money and have that. And they went like hotcakes. The other, the other area I recall uh, was um, Moila Ili and um, Makiki. Makiki, especially Makiki. Small condos. The ones in Waikiki were bigger. Uh, the ones in, uh, up the hill there were, were smaller. We're talking about, you know, half a dozen stories and, you know, not, not too many more units. Um, and every, every man, every woman, Jack, you could find was developing one of these condos. And it was a, it was a, it didn't work well, actually. 
there were, there were a lot of uh, fights among the partners, a lot of fights with the Internal Revenue Service, how you set, how you set up limited partnerships to develop these projects. It was the, it was the Wild West, wasn't it? <laughs> yes, and, and in fact, a lot of the earlier condominiums were leasehold. Right, which is another part of the story. Right. So if we look back to 1960 and we see the number of lawyers writing condominium documents in the state, uh, it would be just a handful. Uh, Hiroshi Sakai, remember him? Yes. He was, he was one, of the guys, uh, one of the guys who actually started writing these papers. But as time went on, uh, it looked profitable, so other lawyers got involved and they, and they were experimenting and sometimes their documents didn't work so well. Have you ever seen condo documents that didn't work so well, Jane? Yeah. The, 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 I mean, they, they, were, they didn't have the details that, that the modern uh, declaration. In fact, the way, the way the statute is set up, the way you create a condominium is you prepare something called a declaration. And the declaration basically uh, says what a condo is. I mean, it's one tower with 300 units and how big are the units and how many parking spaces belong to each unit and what are the common elements and who takes care of what, and, and, and basically the declaration is a document that creates the condominium under, uh, under the statute. And it's created by statute, so uh, it's, it's what we call, it's, it's very specific. In other words, if, if you go to court, that, you know, the, 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 your rights under uh, the condominium are determined by the declaration and the bylaws, which are the governing documents uh, based on the statute, because the whole, concept of a condominium is created by law. And this facilitated transactions. Yes. Because it's very clear what you're getting and what you're giving when you sell. Um, and it facilitated, you know, investment. It uh, facilitated um, escrow companies. They could do transactions very easily. It, it, uh, it, it made for um, bank loans that, that could rely on those documents. And so you could get a bank loan much faster that way. The whole, the whole state was, was going to benefit by this. It sounded like a terrific idea. This is, you know, this is flapjacks all over the place. Um, and, and so, I mean, I suggest to you that we would not be the same state today if that statute had not been passed and if the condominium form of doing business had not been established. Um, but, you know, there were, there were shortfalls, too. There were um, failures to envision the way a condominium project would work um, in, the, in the later years. We'll talk, about, uh, we'll talk about leasehold in a minute, but you know, they, were all, they all had a, a shelf life, uh, a termination date, because of the termination of the lease. But there were problems in dealing with that timeline. Yeah. Yes, and, and in fact, in fact um, the earlier condo documents didn't have in it a, 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 a provision about budget and reserves. And budget and reserves, you know, require condominiums to set aside money. In other words, the, the, the condominiums right now uh, and in the beginning called for payment of maintenance fees. In other words, if you owned a unit, you paid like a monthly dues. And the monthly dues paid for the operating expenses of the condominium. Mm -hmm. The problem with those earlier condo documents is there, uh, there was nothing in it that required the building to set up reserves for... Uh, major repairs. The building is brand new, right? Who knew that, who, you know, why would you be you, setting aside? You didn't aside? know the useful life of that you Right, know, infrastructure. a new roof or replacing the pipes, which is a big issue now, 50 years after the buildings were constructed. Right now, replacing pipes in a building is commonplace. The problem with that is back when the, these documents were created, there was no provision for budget and reserves. And we have to thank, you know, we have to thank for budget and reserves? Senator Maisie Hirono. Interesting. That Good was for back, her. Back, back in the day, she was the House, I, I don't, she may, she may have been consumer protection or housing in the House of Representatives. And I can remember her calling me and saying, you know, I'm tired of getting the, I get these calls from people in Waikiki, you know, where the snowbirds are. And, um, and somebody buys a unit, and they're assessed $10,000 for a brand new roof. <laughs> and, it's, she's, and, and they feel it's not fair. Why do I get assessed when I just 
bought this condo unit. It doesn't sound fair. It, it doesn't all. sound fair, but if you buy the unit and it's 15 years old and needs a new roof, then you have to pay your proportionate share. That's how the documents are set up. Yeah. And so the only way the building can get that money is to specially assess you. Yeah, that was the only technique. That was the only technique. Yeah. And finally, and if you didn't pay the assessment, you'd be foreclosed by the condominium right. association. And so, you know, so Maisie, this happened like two or three years. And, and I was head of a, I mean, right now, I was the lobbying, I was the legislative uh, director for the Hawaii Council of Association of Apartment Owners. I am now the president of that organization. But back then, I was a legislative person. And so Maisie would call me up and she'd beat me up every year. I'm getting more complaints. I want this to stop, and if you don't stop it, I am going to pass a law, and you'll be sorry. And sure enough, she passed this law that required, and you know, some buildings, because they had business people who were managing it, voluntarily set up a budget and reserve system as part of their fiscal structure. But now we had a law, and then it took forever. Well, but a lot of condos... You needed a law, but right. they weren't going to do it. And then the UH had to set up a, a manual, uh, you know, to instruct the condos how to do a budget and reserves, yeah. how to have uh, a reserve specialist come in, figure out what components, what their useful life was, and how to figure out how to set aside a little bit of money every month to pay for that roof in 20 years. And, you know, so... It's very sophisticated It's very stuff. sophisticated and, stuff. And, you know, you have a building, sometimes it's many tens of stories high, you have the roof, you have walls, you have leaks, right? And you have, you have pipes. Elevator you issues, have pipes. You have pipes, you have electrical. And you uh, know, back then, pipes are supposed to last, clay pipes are supposed to last 100 years. Not. <laughs> now we find out, we found out in the last five years, five or six years, yeah. that they don't last. Yeah. They don't last 40 years. Well, and, and then you put on top of that the fact that these, at least they started as owner occupant, where People, you know, had a kind of an emotional stake in their investment, in their unit, and in their relationships with other people. But as time went by, it became investors. And so the board, the nature of the boards changed from owner occupants to investor occupants. Well, investor you know, owners. when Maisie was beating me up, her complaints were coming from Waikiki. And Waikiki, like I told you, were the snowbirds. They were the Canadians who came down there and they bought these units and they would come down for vacation. They'd have their friends stay there while, while they were on vacation. These people were not interested in deferred maintenance. Right? They just wanted a place to stay when they came for vacation. Right. They fell apart. They didn't care. And they didn't care. And so, and so if you had owner occupants and you had uh, you know, people who you know, cared about what was going to happen to their building, these are the people who voluntarily set up budget and reserves system is part of their fiscal. It's a minority group. A minority group. And until Maisie passed that law, it, condos were not required to do budget but and reserves. But the default position was um, the board of directors of a given of the average condo uh, were clueless. Right. The people there were not professionals. Uh, they didn't have a clue on how you manage a property, how you do accounting, uh, and uh, you know, establish reserves for a property, even how you fix a property, or how you engage contractors to fix a property, nothing. And so they stumbled and bumbled around, many of them. And then they would hire uh, management companies uh, who had no experience in this either. And, and the management companies were never paid very well, in my opinion, for managing these multi-million dollar properties, no clue. So you had a, a board with no clue, a manager with no clue, and a building that was are relentlessly deteriorating right in front of you. Right. This leads to a bad place. Yes, and, and, and people are feeling it now, 30, 40 years later, when they ha are, are faced with uh, a situation where they, they're building leaks like a sieve and they, ha they hire an engineering company who says you have to replace your pipes. And there's no money in the reserves to pay for the replacement of the pipes because nobody knew or had a clue that the pipes would deteriorate in 30, 40 years. What are we talking about in money? I mean, for example, it was a shock to me to find out that painting my condominium building would cost $300,000. Replacing so pipes, a, I think uh, one of the buildings, uh, Pro Ridge Condo and Gardens, last uh, maybe three years ago, $20 million. $20 million? Oh, wow. And, so and that's got to be paid by the owners. Right. And if you don't have the money in your reserves, the way the building, the association gets it is you do a special assessment. 
That's a big assessment per unit. You take the amount of $20 million and you divide it up among the people. And luckily, because the interest rates are so low and condos are, you know, uh, especially if you're, you have a high percentage of owner occupants, you're a good credit risk. And so the banks in town are just salivating to get that business. <clears throat> you know, the other thing, just to throw it in the, in the, in the fire here, is that in the early days, and this probably still continues, I know you, you see it in the paper all the time, is that the, the contractors who built the condo in the first place may have skipped on stuff. They may have done a bad job. And so there follows uh, construction litigation. Uh, you know, it's almost as if every building uh, that got built uh, had some kind of construction litigation against the original developer and contractor. And the board has got, and the manager, they got to be Akamai enough to know when to do that, how to do that, how to pay the legal expenses, and how to manage the settlement issues. And it's very complicated for a board that's not sophisticated. This happened in really most condominiums you can think and it's, of. And it's still happening now. I mean, they're talking about Kaka'ako and the building boom. Yeah. And what's going to follow the building boom are the construction defect cases. And, and about 10 years ago, the Contractors went to the legislature and they said, they said, oh, you know, we just can't take, you know, fighting with the condos, with the condo deal. Because you're talking a huge problem. Hundreds of millions sometimes. Right. Trying to fix the, the defect. And so there's got to be a better way and it's very expensive. So now they, you know, the, the, the law has changed so that if it's a condominium and it's a construction defect case, you've got to go through mediation and arbitration. Mm. You don't go to litigation because that oh, becomes complex litigation. Inefficient. Right, and it's very expensive yeah. and time consuming. It goes on for years. Yeah. yeah. When we come back from this break, I want to ask Jane about comparing condos with co-ops. It's a different art form, a different mm. business form, different real estate ownership form. It started around the same time in the 60s and where that has gone relative to in comparison with condos. I also want to talk to her about her favorite subject. Not only is Jane <laughs> the president of the Hawaii Council of Association of Apartment Owners, but she's been that for a long time. And she's also the one person in the state of Hawaii who knows more and was more heavily involved in, in the leasehold initiative here. She's a living treasure in that regard, okay? When we come back, we're gonna find out why. Woo, we'll be right back. Aloha, I'm Wendy Lowe, and I'm coming to you every other Tuesday at 2 o'clock, live from Think Tech Hawaii. And on our show, we talk about taking your health back. And what does that mean? It means mind, body, and soul. Anything you can do that makes your body healthier and happier is what we're going to be talking about. Whether it's spiritual health, mental health, fascia health, beautiful smile health, whatever it means, let's take healthy back. Aloha. <laughs> Aloha, I'm Lauren Pear, a host here at Think Tech Hawaii, a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness in Hawaii. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of its supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you'd go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Thanks so much. We're back on Condo Insider with Jane Sugimura, who is the true host. Today, she's a host guest of Condo mm -hmm. Insider. And we're talking about a little history for condos uh, and leasehold. We're going to get to leasehold in a second, I promise. But co-ops, no discussion of condos without com could be complete without comparing them to co-ops. Right. What's the deal on co-ops? Co-ops are um, the form of ownership. It's a corporation. And it's governed by, I think it's uh, HRS. 415, which is a corporation statute. And so uh, uh, the corporation has got shareholders. And so if you are a unit owner, you become a shareholder of the corporation, and then you are given a proprietary lease. And the board of directors is just like a regular corporation. I mean, the, the unit owners, you know, vote and you, you, you vote for a board of directors, and the board of directors runs the uh, association. The res, you know, the residential association, and there was talk. Uh, th there's always talk about 
because it's a different type, it's not subject to 514B or A. And, um, and we also have another statute for community associations, that's 421J. And so there have been talks about making one complete, one statute that would cover community associations, condo, condominiums, and co-ops, and because they're something called common ownership mm -hmm. yeah, residential a, units. A common denominator. There. Right, and there is a statute in California that we've looked at, but there's just, you know, too many divergent interests that we're not going to get everybody on the same mm -hmm. page. It don't, we haven't been able to get a consensus to do that, but there has been discussions over the years to make one statute that, that would govern all those three types of or, uh, you know, community associations. How, how are co-ops different, you know, in terms of living in them, uh, buying and selling them, uh, managing them? Well, you know, it, it, is a, it is a residential association, but you're, it's like buying stock shares in a co company. You're buying stock. And, and so uh, when you sell it, you sell your stock. You sell your is stock. Is it as marketable as a condo? I, I think it, it is in most situations, but, you know, the difference between a condo and a co-op, and I don't know if the... The co-ops in, 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 in Hawaii still do this. And most of the, I think all the co-ops are, are, are here in Honolulu. Yeah, Waikiki. They're, yeah, Waikiki. Yeah. There are not a lot of them. Yeah, on the, the, on the Malchus side of Kuhio Avenue. Yeah. And, uh, but, you know, with, with co-ops, uh, they have to approve. The, the board has to approve of you as a, a buyer. And this, that does not exist in the condo model at no. all. No, it's, you know, anybody can buy so into that's, it. But. That's slightly offensive, and it, it uh, I mean, because you never know what the reason is. Even if they say it's one reason, it could be another reason. Uh, but the other, the other thing that bothers me about it is it, it, it hampers the free trans transferability sale of your interest in the co-op. Well, it's just one additional step that yeah. is not, I mean, you, you have to be approved by the board. Yeah, yeah. And so you have to basically apply, and you bit, you're interviewed, and if they say you're okay, then, it's on the way out, isn't it? Nobody's doing it anymore. Are there any developers actually developing co-ops these days? I don't think so. You know, and I don't, I don't think they've done that. I mean, I don't think any developer's done that in many decades. It's, a, it's a, a handful of them. They're in Waikiki. If they were smart, they would convert it into a condo somehow. And they can. We, they can do that? They can yeah. convert. Yeah. And they, I, I've smart. heard of them do, doing that. Yeah, okay. All right, so moving on to the main subject of this part of our show, leasehold. You were instrumental in developing the Hawaii Leasehold Conversion Ordinance, was it? Um, back when uh, you worked night and day on having that happen. Uh, I don't. I, yeah, I can't say that I was instrumental because there, there was a bunch of us, and it was uh, a group called the Hale Coalition, and we were we kind of modeled it on something called the Baltimore Act, you know, which converted the leasehold in Baltimore so that people who lived in leasehold property could buy their fee. Now, until that, and that oh, it's an ordinance, right? Yeah. It was an ordinance. Until that ordinance, uh, a leasehold tenant, a long-term leasehold tenant, had no right to buy the fee under his property, right? Right. I mean, he, he and, was completely shut out from that uh, unless he, he had a really terrific relationship with the fee owner, which was usually not the case. Um, and he couldn't do it. It was not an option. Well, in Hawaii, there was something called the Land Reform Act. And the Land Reform Act, because uh, there were leasehold residential single-family residences owned by Bishop Estate. And that case went all the way up to the Supreme Court. That was in the 50s and 60s. And, and in that case, you know, the Supreme Court held that, uh, that a person owning their home was a public purpose. And for that, the state could condemn. And that so before the ordinance ever happened, right? And so that's what we were modeling our idea. We figured, well, you know, if single-family homeowners could buy their leasehold property, why couldn't condominiums? And we were told we were different. Well, they were, you know, you're different. I mean, with a single-family homeowner, you're talking about one home, but when you're talking about uh, uh, you know, condominiums, you're talking about 300 families or 600 families or 100 families. Well, the bottom line is they didn't want to sell it to you. Right, they didn't want to sell it to us. It was better economically for them to hold on to it and collect the lease rent. Oh, and, and, and two, they argued that with the single family homes, there was a, the, the court found that it was an oligarchy, which was a single landowner that owned the, the fee. With condominiums, 
you had small landowners and small landowners. And, and to give you an example, Discovery Bay. Discovery Bay, basically where that building is now, there were five homeowners, okay? And so the developer goes to the five homeowners and says, give us a lease for your land, and, you know, after 50 years, you'll get it back. That was the deal. And so, so they signed off on it, and I think Bank of Hawaii became the trustee for the, 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 le the lessees, and the developer built Discovery Bay. I think it's 600 units. This creates a big problem when you're trying to buy the fee out. Right. Because it's a patchwork of, of fee owners under the leasehold condo. Right. And so that's another one. And Yacht Harbor Tower was three, three, yeah. three Robinson Trusts. And I can't remember. One, and, you know, so, the, so all, a lot, of, especially in Waikiki, I mean, uh, Makiki, Makiki, there were lots of, in fact, all the condos in Makiki were these small landowners. And the developer would come to them and say, give us your land. And, you know, we're going to we'll make it worth your while. Yeah, we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll make it worth your while. We're going to build this condo. And 50 years from now, you get it back. And you get lease rent the whole time. All right. What a sweet deal. Right. I said, you know, the truth, though, is looking back down the road, Jane, from all that you know, wouldn't it have been better when they established the condominium statute in the first place to say, it's only fee. You can't have this patchwork because there's too many unknown problems that come back to bite everyone. Uh, if you if you make it a patchwork, if you make it leasehold, well, it, just sell out the fee. No, it's not in the it's not in the condominium statute. And you know, the back then, the the argument or the 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 the, the pitch was that most people can't afford to own a home in in Hawaii. But if you take a leasehold property, which is not fee, that eventually goes back to the fee owner, we can sell it for cheaper. Right. So this is like an installment sale. Right. You pay less now. And you have unknown problems later. <laughs> right. And it's good for the people who buy in the beginning. Well, and they can spin it, right? They can right. sell it so, off and it's not their problem anymore. Right. You know, the next fool theory. And, but then it catches up to you at some point. Yes, it catches up to you because the lease has got a provision in there that says that after 25 years, there's a rent renegotiation. The problem is if you bought the leasehold property before the leasehold disclosure law was passed in 1991, which most affected most people because the condominiums were built, built in the 60s. And the leasehold disclosure law didn't come into effect until 1991 after the fight had already started because that's when the, the fee owners would be giving their rent renegotiation proposals to the uh, leasehold lessees. And it was like, oh, my God. Who, who, we never knew that our lease rent would go from something like you know, $500 a year Fifteen hundred dollars a year, <laughs> multiples and multiples. I remember that whole period of time, and it's still possible that would happen too. And that's when they found out that not only do you have rent renegotiation, now you got to pay a lot more for your leasehold property. It's going to be harder to sell. The closer you get right. to the end of the fee, the lenders won't lend money right. unless you have twenty to thirty years fixed. And so when you get to that that time where there's not twenty five years left on the lease. The lenders won't give your purchaser a mortgage to buy your leasehold unit. And that's why it's so important. It was so important that's to what have started a conversion. The, that started ordinance. the dispute way back then yeah, yeah. because people finally, well, that, that led to the leasehold disclosure law that says when you, with leasehold, uh, if you have leasehold property, when you sell it, you need to tell people what the underlying lease says. You have to give the rent renegotiation dates, the reopening dates, and the formula yeah. on how you determine. Yeah, but you know what? Some people just never look at that. They say, well, I'm not going to worry about that. Oh, I'll no, sell it, it out long before that. The, with the leasehold disclosure, it, 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 well, the funny thing about the leasehold disclosure, when it passed, it didn't get implemented for almost three years. You know why? The realtors hated it because they said it was going to kill the market. Well, it would certainly slow the market down right. if people read it and became concerned. Right. You know, Jane, this is a fabulous discussion. Yep. You know, there aren't many people really in the state of Hawaii who've been through it the way you have, who've seen it evolve, who've seen the pits and falls, and, and who've seen people get burned, and who've seen the need for changes. 
And we still have a huge need for change now. Yeah. It's an ongoing thing. But I, you know, you should write a book, or at the very least, you should cover this on your Condo Insider show on a regular basis. It is so rich. It is interwoven with our history, economically, our culturally, socially. Um, we, Especially we now, to... since the state of Hawaii has got a bill in the legislature calling for leasehold, uh, 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 lease, uh, you know, taking state land and doing leasehold sales for affordable housing, 50-year leases. We'd better be really smart about that. And, and it's like, haven't they, don't they realize that, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it might be a good thing now, but what happens 25 years into the program? You've got to look 25 years down the road and figure it out so it doesn't burn anybody. Right. Anyway, Jane uh, Sugimura, thank you very much for coming down. You're the original host of Condo Insider. We sure appreciate this special show with you. Thank you. Mahalo.